there is a vaccine available this year to prevent COVID, which is a monovalent vaccine, which means it contains one strain. That strain is the XBB.1.5 strain. So who should get it? Well, a number of countries have weighed in on this. The United Kingdom, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, Australia, as well as the World Health Organization. And their recommendation is a targeted approach, meaning let's prevent those who are most likely to suffer serious disease. And by serious disease, I mean be admitted to the hospital, the intensive care unit, or die. Because that's the goal of this vaccine, prevent serious illness. So those groups were people who are elderly, people who have multiple comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, people who are immune compromised, typically because they're taking medicines that suppress their immune system and pregnant people. So that's what these countries decided to do. Now, the United States made a different decision. So what they decided in the past week is that they want to offer this vaccine to everyone over six months of age. So why? Why are we then taking a position different from those countries? So during the, the committee hearing, um, which was last week, um, there was basically a six hour discussion where they brought up a number of points to try and make a case for a broader recommendation. One was the notion of obesity. And so what they presented were data that about 70% of the country are either obese or overweight. Now, overweight is not a, a, a risk factor. Obesity is um, less than half the country is obese, probably closer to 40%. And you could make the argument that, that, that if you're not obese, um, that doesn't mean that you should get this vaccine. So why say vaccinate everybody just because a fairly large percentage of the country is obese? The second reason was long COVID. Wouldn't it make sense to give an additional dose to prevent your chance of having long COVID, you know, which is characterized by fatigue, headache, brain fog, et cetera, muscle ache, et cetera. So are there data to support that? That, a, that additional doses beyond what most people have already gotten, because most people at this point have already gotten a few doses plus a natural infection, which is defined as hybrid immunity. And most of this country at that, this point has that. We have a high level of population immunity. Does an extra dose make a difference? So this hasn't been well studied. And, and the, the term long COVID is probably more than one thing and it's variously defined. But there was one study in Italy that did look at this. So what they did was they looked at people who didn't get any vaccine and then got COVID and found that the incidence of long COVID was 42%. Then they looked at people who'd gotten one dose of vaccine, then got COVID, and the incidence of long COVID there was 30%. So it went from 42% to 30%. Then they looked at people who'd gotten two doses of the vaccine and got COVID, and the incidence of long COVID was 17%. So it went from 30% to 17%. Then they looked at people who'd gotten three doses of vaccine and then got COVID, and the incidence of long COVID went from 17% to 16%. So no difference. So that additional dose beyond two doses, at least in that study, didn't make a difference. The third reason that was argued for here, um, which I think didn't make a lot of sense, was that if you look at the group most likely to be hospitalized, not surprisingly, that group was over 75 years of age. The group that was second most likely to be hospitalized was children between six months and four years of age, most of whom, or many of whom, were otherwise healthy. So why that group? And the answer is, the children in general are the least vaccinated group, and children less than four years of age are the least of the least vaccinated group. So about 10% of children less than four years of age have been vaccinated. That's why they're getting hospitalized. It's not because they need a booster dose. It's because they need to be vaccinated in general. And so instead of trying to argue for a booster dose for that 10%, I think we should be arguing for a vaccine for the 90%. So I don't um, support the, the notion of trying to vaccinate everybody because I think we should really have the, we will have the biggest impact by, by focusing on high risk groups. Now, the, the question is, how does this get communicated? Some people will argue reasonably that if you have a more nuanced message, that will be a garbled message, that it won't be understood by the general public. Um, but we certainly have nuanced messages for other things. So for example, um, there is now a monoclonal antibody available to protect against respiratory syncytial virus in babies. All babies uh, less than eight months of age are recommended to receive this monoclonal antibody. It's long acting, it's called nirsevimab or uh, otherwise known as Bay Fortis. But for the second year of life, the eight to 19 month old, that's only recommended for high risk groups. So that's not, that is a nuanced message. We could make it easier by saying 
everybody should get nirsevimab for the first two RSV seasons. But we didn't say that. We said, here's who should get it in the first season. Here's who should get it in the second season. So we do have targeted recommendations. And I think um, we should trust the American public to be able to understand the thinking behind why we make various recommendations. It's interesting to see how this will play out this winter, because the way that I think some people understand this, this vaccine is that it's like flu. We have likened this to flu. And certainly it's important to get a flu vaccine every year. Everybody over six months should get a flu vaccine every year. Now, the, the flu vaccine is strain specific. Um, if you're wrong and the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee sits down in March of every year and tries to figure out what strains are going to come into this country, and they use that information based on uh, countries that have winters that precede ours, as to what strains are likely to come in. And if you miss with, with flu, a miss is a mile, you pick the wrong strain and you, you're, you're in trouble. And that's what happened. If you look at those, those years where we missed, protection against severe disease was less than 20%. So that's not good. That's not this virus. That's not SARS-CoV-2. And the reason is, is that protection against severe disease is largely mediated by T cells memory T cells. It takes time to develop severe disease. It takes 10 days, 14 days to develop severe disease. So if you have memory cells, that's plenty of time for those memory cells to become activated, differentiate, and make T cells like cytotoxic T cells, which kill virus-infected cells. And the good news about this, this particular um, um, immunological component, T cells, is that the, the parts of the virus that are recognized by T cells are relatively conserved. 80 to 85% conservation from the original strain, the ancestral strain, to the current strains, EG5, BA2.86. The T cell epitopes haven't dramatically changed, and that's why you're still protected against severe disease. In any case, I think it's very important for people who are in high-risk groups to get this vaccine, and certainly for people who live in the home of someone who's immune compromised, who, who work in a nursing home. And I think anybody who wants to get a vaccine certainly should be encouraged to get it. But I'm not sure why we made that recommendation. Maybe it's because we have, to some extent, a dysfunctional healthcare system, and we fear that by making a targeted recommendation that private insurers won't then cover those other people, say, who live or work in nursing homes or who live in the home of someone who's immune compromised. Maybe that's the reason, but we are in many ways different than many other countries in terms of how we recommend this vaccine.